I am really here to find out what the Borscht Belt was. They realized if I built a small little bungalow with one bathroom, one bedroom, and a tiny little kitchen, I could rent those out and everybody would be happy. They would go back to the same bungalow colony and it would be like this group of people that grew up together with their kids growing up together. It was great. Hello all, my name is Frida Weisel and on this channel I explore many facets of Jewish life. I'm now publishing a series of videos on the Jewish cat skills and as part of that, today I'm going for a visit to the Borscht Belt Museum. Would it be okay if we film here a little? No. It's, yeah. Really? It's just, of course. This is a new museum in beautiful upstate town of Ellenville, New York. It commemorates the Catskills of yore, the period in New York Jewish history that is now so iconic in pop culture, with the big scenes in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel or in the classic rom-com Dirty Dancing. In its heyday from the 1920s to the 1950s, the Borscht Belt was a hub for New York City Jews, not the Hasidim who are in the Catskills today, but a very different Jewish culture. Alan Frischman is my guide. He is a serious collector, passionate about the Bourge Belt, something of a jokester, and he agrees to sit down for a chat and a little tour. My name is Alan Frischman. Uh, I was born and raised in Monticello, and then I moved to Mountaindale after college, and I've been there ever since. But I've always collected Bourge Belt and old items, tchotchkes from the 50s. So a little bit about it here that my mom used to drag me to auctions and that's how I got the book to collect things and fortunately I was a building inspector for about 24 years in the town of Fallsburg and anytime we had to tear a building down I had to go in and do a whole report I was a little bit involved and that's when I would see like, some of the signs on like the new Victory Bungalow Colony I love that sign because it's advertising television so it's something I saved, so it wasn't either burnt up or buried. So I just had the eye to collect these items. It just continues to this day. So the table, the chairs, a lot of the ephemera, which is a word for historical documents, inside the cases is part of my collection. The model I made of a bungalow. Oh, lovely. Yeah. It's a lovely museum. I am really here to find out what the Borscht Belt was. Was. It is. is. It is. Okay. So the Borscht Belt started. Do you know the history or no? A little his history. A we would love history is that the immigrants that came over from Russia, Poland, Europe, settled in Manhattan. In Jewish Canada. immigrants. I'm talking Jewish immigrants. There were others. There was another group of Irish immigrants. There was a small group of black people that also settled in an area and had their own enclave you know this was a place to get away but the basic history is that from living in the tenements they wanted to get out so they came to sullivan county thinking they could for the summer no 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 oh. all year round forget that portion they wanted to move here to become a farmer like when? they were in europe probably in the 20s and the 30s the problem was it wasn't many places for them to buy because it was owned by the Gentiles at that point and they weren't willing to give up their property so fast but it started little by little and they started buying the old farm homes farmhouses that's how my family got into Mountaindale and there was a beautiful main house which they all had but once the Jews got it they said you know we can't the reason they couldn't be farmers is because for every soil there's two rocks the soil up here is here in terrible. Sullivan. I they couldn't see. really make a good living farming, but they could raise chickens and they had cows for fresh milk and eggs. And all those things just came into place. And they realized they could rent out rooms in the main house. And that's how they made their money. And that's how it started. So the first thing they had, they called them kachalanes, which means it was a community kitchen. I don't know if you ever heard Kachalanes, but that's how it started where people would come up for several weeks and they had a kitchen that was shared by everybody. It'd be a huge icebox and there'd be a couple stoves and all the women would have to share the kitchen. It was called Kachalane. And the, what started happening was if one woman stole this one's butter and this one wasn't clean in the kitchen, all the fights started. Now at the same time, there was also the beginning of the small hotels, Rose Singers, 
Kutcher's was an older one. That started. But the bungalow colonies, which is what I'm familiar with, they realized if I built a small little bungalow with one bathroom, one bedroom, and a tiny little kitchen, which is what's in that model, I could rent those out and everybody would be happy. And it stopped the fighting. Of so the, having bungalow, the big kitchen. So bungalow colonies grew from that point. When did they become a summer thing? They were always summer. They were, you know, it's some of the hotels became all year round, I'd say, in the 50s. I see. Late 40s, 50s, they became all year round. But before that, it was always summer. Because the bungalows were built just for summertime purposes. There was no way to winterize them. There was no insulation. The plumbing wasn't designed well. How, so, how, did, we, how did we go from uh, people coming here to farm to people coming here just for the summer? Well, when they realized that they could make money renting out rooms, that was the beginning uh, of the resort area. The very, very beginning in the 20s and the 30s. I see. But then things started to grow. And then the farms, if you had, a, like in my, my family's place, Hemlock Grove, at the farm, any outbuilding, the pigsty building, whatever they called it, and the chicken coops, my grandfather converted those to bungalows. So they were always the old farm buildings. But you put in a bathroom, you put in a tiny little kitchen with an old cast iron sink. And people from, and from the city. Beds, and they would come up and rent them. For the summer. For the summer. Yeah, in bungalow colonies, it usually was for the summer. Hotels, it was usually a week or two weeks. If you had a lot of guilt, it would be for the whole uh -huh. summer, but not too often. So there was two different areas, hotels and bungalow colonies. But that's how it grew from the Jewish immigrants in the city wanting to come up and, the, and just come up here. And it was called the Borscht Belt because in the 40s, I think there was a columnist, I don't remember the paper, and he, he just uh, had that term, Borscht Belt, and it stuck. Borscht because it was the... Because they served a lot of borscht in the hotels. That was a uh, uh, Ukrainian, Russian, Russian dish yeah. of borscht with sour cream and a boiled potato or a baked boiled potato. Beet, most importantly, no? Beet. It, basically, it's beet, vinegar, a little salt and water. When, I, when my garden grows well and I have enough beets, I make my own. Really? But now, you know, you just get it in the jar, but that was a very popular dish served or made by people. You know, they'd buy beets and they'd make their own because they had recipes from their, from their grandparents. Their and you drank it cold. Yeah, now there's other borscht. My family makes warm. Warm, with a lot of vegetables and other things. Potatoes, a, a, an egg, you know, an egg yeah. beat into yeah. it. I was at a Ukrainian friend and she made me some borscht last year. You know, she said, have lunch with me. We're having borscht. I said, it's a, it was a cold winter day. She said, no, 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 no. This is a different kind of borscht. So basically that's a hot soup. Yeah, yeah. You know, but there's a lot of, the basic borscht was the cold beet borscht. Serve it maybe a piece of rye bread and a schmear of butter, you know, that was good too. Can you still get borscht if I want to get borscht now? Yeah. Where would I get borscht? ShopRite. I don't know if this one, I know in Monticello, that's where I buy it. You go in the kosher section and they've got all the kosher products. If you don't like beets, don't buy it. I don't, I know already that I don't like, not, not that much beets as you get in borscht, but I'm going to buy it. And sour cream. Oh no, that's way too much. <laughs> Well, that's how you have your borscht. Really? Yeah, you pour some in the jar, you put a dollop of sour cream in, and you mix it. And you mix it, up, I see. And then you have your potato on the side. Uh-huh. That's, that's the basic recipe of having borscht for lunch. Do you it's love very, borscht? I love it. It's very refreshing, you know? You have to be used to eating it, I think. Try it. I'm going to try it. you got to try it. I'm going to go try it after this. Uh, can I ask you two more questions? And then if you don't mind for the camera, if you could show us around, we would love that. Um, at its height, how many uh, how many Jews came to summer? In, uh, in the number, I couldn't tell you. But at one point, like in the fifties, when the Cascos was really booming, there were at least five hundred hotels, large ones to small ones, and over fifty thousand bungalows. Wow! It was a lot. It was a lot. Yes, yeah, way before your time. It. I mean, yeah. But I'm glad that you're researching and doing this now. That just 
show people, educate people. Yeah, I, I, here, I, you know. Yeah. Do you feel less? Do, I mean, it was. Do, do you have any memories of the Borscht Belt? I wrote two books about it already. I see. One's called Tales of a Casco Mountain Plumber, because okay. I was a plumber with my dad. And the second one is called More Borscht from a Casco Mountain Plumber. Please buy my books. It helps my retirement. And the first book was more family stories, very funny stories, some stories from other people. But the second book was every time I would do a, a discussion, and I also do a slideshow called Katsko Tchotchkes. You know the Tchotchkes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know the Tchotchkes. Are you Jewish? I'm Jewish, and I speak Yiddish. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I feel learned in Besser. <laughs> so, we'll, we'll do a lesson. So the bottom line is, for, uh, my, I had very fond memories growing up here, being a plumber with my dad, bungalow plumbers. That's what I was. I, I was see. not a real plumber like he was. He didn't want me to be a plumber. So I didn't pay attention to the important stuff. Uh -huh. you know yeah, and but I'm the like, experience in hindsight. Oh, uh, it was the best. You know, my dad is still alive at 96. Awesome. I'm going to visit him in three weeks. And all we did was sit around and talk about old times, the jobs, different people that really stood out. And it just, it's, it'll never die. It'll never die. It's so the second book was all, almost 80% are stories that I heard from other people telling me their experiences. And the way you get into my books you have to make me laugh or a really big smile. That's the test. I see. Without that, it's just like too factual. Nobody wants to read about, oh, my uncle worked in the Pines Hotel as the head maitre d' for 20 years. So what? There's not enough there. You like characters. I like characters. People that just make me laugh. And there's so many funny, crazy stories like that about the Catskills. And I'm still getting more because I'm working on my third book now called the filter fish for the soul wow so they say the filter fish for the stomach is not so great for the soul it's good for the soul it is good for the soul <laughs> <laughs> i don't know but i like the title and everybody else does it is good so that's sticking so i'm actually trying to work on two simultaneously because the other one is called catskill tchotchkes what happened that that all of that humor the comedy wait, the... wait a minute the comedy never died the comedy never died it never died the comedy that was born here from all the comedians that started, you know, like Sid Caesar, Neil Pearl, uh, you know, Danny Kay, all these old timers. Some of them started as a Tumblr. You know what the Tumblr was? The Tumblr was the social director of a hotel. I see. He had to entertain the people all the time. He would do Simon Says. He would play games. He would tell jokes. He would run in the dining room and make people laugh and just give him a good time. That was his job, the Tumblr. And some of the Tumblr- It's like Tumblr is the Hebrew word for like making a, t a Yiddish for making a big to-do? I don't know if it's a Yiddish word or not. I see. Maybe, yeah, you know why? Because don't make a big tumult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know. That's Yiddish. Yeah, so maybe Tumblr came from Tumblr. I think so. I see. But that was the person that would make you laugh and have a good time. And some of them started in that, you know, job. But they got good at it and they started practicing their jokes and they started having a routine and they became famous comedians. Those famous comedians taught the other comedians. Stand up was created here. This was really, the, yeah. You know, you had vaudeville, Jewish vaudeville, and from that became the Tumblr, and from that became comedians. I mean, even Jerry Seinfeld started in the Concord Hotel, John Stewart, I got brochures with him in the later portion of when the Concord was open, but they all practiced up here. That's how you learn to become a comedian. You write your jokes and you test them out. You feel the audience and you see what they laugh at. What didn't they laugh at? And that's what they did. The early comedians tested their materials. And the young man and his jokes, Rodney Dangerfield, I mean, they all started up here. I didn't realize, though, that stand-up started in the Catskill and Borscht yeah. Belt, essentially. This is where it all started. So that didn't die. That didn't die, but... But the Catskills died because of the three A's. You know about that? Automobiles, air conditioning, and airplanes. 
a lot of people escaped the city because of the heat and they would come up here. This is prior to air conditioning to cool off. It was always 10 degrees cooler yeah, and there's... there were lakes. Before there were swimming pools, there was always a lake that you could jump into. It. Okay, Everybody had a lake or a stream and that's how you cooled off. So they would come up for that. Then they had to build swimming pools because the Board of Health said, we don't want people swimming in the lakes that could be contaminated and that, that, that. So all the colonies were forced to build swimming pools. That took a lot of money. It hurt some of them, but they had to do it to keep up, to keep renting. So that was one of the hits that some of the owners took. And of course, airplanes, instead of, you know, the younger generation I said, see. why should we come up to a stinky Obama? I'm going to take go. my family to Europe. And another thing that actually killed the mountains was the owners themselves, because wow. they wanted to make sure that their children didn't have to suffer. And what did the Jewish families do? They made sure their kids went to college. So they left. Well, when they came out as a doctor or a lawyer, they're not going to run a schlocky hotel for two months. In the summer? They practice a doctor's practice or a lawyer's or so it's like it was their own demise in a good way because they wanted their kids to do better than they, they had done because it was a struggle it was no party yeah it was no party of uh, running a hotel yeah yeah you work your butt off i mean even even my family and i was just remarking how we would work the season was kind of started around memorial weekend but july 4th weekend we would work every day straight through the whole until week. maybe the middle of August we could take a day off. It took a lot of effort to get the water running again. Yeah. You know, people well, thought, oh, you just open up the valve. The, big, the yeah. plumbing was the worst possible plumbing you could imagine. And you drained it the best you could, but there were leaks all over the place. And that's what you spent, you know, trying to fix to get the water to run. We leave off with you telling me your favorite four spell joke. Joke? Joke, yeah. Oh, wow. Uh, whatever okay. stick. Okay. Two old Jewish guys are on Miami, are in, are in Miami Beach, and they're sitting there, and one says to the other, you know, Sam, I can tell you exactly how old you are, right to the day. He says, that's impossible. I'll prove it to you. Take your T-shirt off. And he's looking at him, he's looking at him. He says, I need more information. What do you need? Drop your trunks. Oh, no. I can't drop my trunks. We're on the beach. You're an alta caca. Nobody cares about you. You're an old guy. All right. He drops his trunks. He looks at him. He says, you were born on May 17th in 1939. He says, oh, my gosh. How, How did you, you know? able to do that? Schmuck, you told me yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> I got you. You got that? I got it. All right. Show me around a little. Okay. Show me what you have. This is the start of the culture right here. These panels explain kind of what I told you about them. So it goes on to describe people that came to the mountains and the rocky soil was too difficult. And basically it's what I explained before. I see. They settled into the region. This was the Jewish vacation guide, sort of like the Green Book, if you've heard of that. And it would tell you places to stay. Reliable, verlässliche per, per, per insurance. Again, a reliable, dependable insurance agents. These are just the brochures and you can see by the age and the photographs, what did they advertise? They didn't have any video games or modern things. It was fishing, basketball, you know, stuff of that nature. Um, and they, some of the brochures had great photographs of the dining rooms and they all had the palladian windows and everyone ate together oh yeah i mean the kitchens from what the waiters have told me some of the stories was a zoo and you yeah. had and you had different chefs from different countries and you'd learn curse words from in all languages in all languages that's the first thing that you learned i want to see the bungalow this is a model of a bungalow who, who built it by the me way? You built the model? Yeah, I'm a model builder too. Oh. That's my model. Jack of all trades, I guess, yeah, Alan. Lots. And this is a typical bungalow. You had a little tiny porch. Balcony. Kitchen, just enough room for a kitchen and a table, one bathroom, closet, and a bedroom. Usually you had two beds, one for the parents, one for the kids. How many people usually stayed in a single bungalow? Four. Four. Everybody slept in one room. 
nobody had decks. They didn't invent decks yet, so all there was was concrete steps filled mostly with rocks because that was cheap. Cement cost money, and the railings were a bent piece of pipe and screened in porch. But there would be a series of these bungalows oh, yeah. in a colony. Yeah. See the postcard right there? Cutlers. That was in Fallsburg. Typical bungalow colony, one after another. So the, the appeal of a bungalow colony is you have all of these little cheap houses combining into a and, social... And you have a community. And after a while, a lot of people stayed in this. They would go back to the same bungalow colony. And it would be like this group of people that grew up together with their kids growing up together. It was great. Wow, fantastic. So these are pieces from my collection in my house. An old refrigerator, obviously. This is just when they went from ice to refrigeration. That's the compressor. So this is probably 1930, late 30s. And you can see it looks just like an ice box. Old gas stove, early, again, early stove. You know what this is for? No idea. No idea. Making toast. You put a piece of toast here. The flame is here. Brown the bread. Flip the toast over. And so they made toast. They didn't have toasters. This is pre toast. It didn't end up on the bottom, just blackened in the top. You had yeah. to do it. You had to be able to know. I see. How to use your toast. It wasn't easy. These are old soda fountain cups, you know, from the soda jerk. And this is just a collect small taste of the things in my house from the 50s. Old, old iron. This is heavy. And that's without the water in it. Old, old radio tubes. Before we had all this electronic kazurai, had tubes in them. Old tube radios. These are brand new. Wow. I've got cases of them. They look well, like light bulbs. I owned a, uh, a radio repair store, so I didn't let anybody throw anything out in my family. I have a question. Was the process of the Borscht uh, Belt cultural life collapsing difficult for you personally? To some degree, I miss, I miss, and, and you can ask anybody here that's come to visit, they miss what was. It was so nice. It was so good. Life was different. It was just a different time. Am I glad I'm not working as a plumber with my dad anymore? Yeah. Yeah. You know, but the life, it was just so easy compared to today. You know, we didn't have the same problems. There's problems to them, but uh, well, wasn't vintage, there a vintage. Oh, this is vintage, vintage? Yep. You never saw glass handles. Come on. I have no idea, but now, yeah. now I'm noticing. Oh, that does sound... I said in Feels. the new bathroom, because this is all going to get gutted and we're going to redo it. This is going in. This is going in. That's 50s. That's 50s. That's 50s. You guys never knew you wanted to turn on glass handles until you saw the bathroom in the, in, in the, in the museum. The children's dining room. You know, they had, in the hotels, they had counselors to take care of the kids because the parents wanted to be on vacation. And then they would have babysitters at night so that they could go to the shows. But they had to bring their kids up. You know what I mean? And there was a lot of food. So the parents were really having a good time letting their hair food down. It was endless. endless. That was the, not the joke, but the reality. Alan, it was such a pleasure. Thank you for the spontaneous little okay. um, introduction to this very so different era. Bye guys, thank you, bye. bye.